All right, we might get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Women in Aerospace Ecosystem panel session. My name is Celeste Mezias and I'm your session chair for today. Just in case it slipped your mind, uh, standard housekeeping rules apply. Please follow the signs of the exits and the house star staff will guide us in the event of an emergency. And please keep your phones to silent during the duration of this session. As this session is recorded, we ask that if at any time you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll come around with a microphone uh, to let you speak. Otherwise, at the end of the session, we will also have a question time um, and you can line up at the microphone at the back. I'd like to introduce you to our panel moderator, Nikki Vasey, from a company I'm very proud to be a part of, Boeing Australia. Nikki Vasey joined Boeing in April 2019 as a BR&T Boeing Research and Technology Australia manager. Based at the Brisbane Technology Centre, UQ, she has a track record of successfully managing cross-disciplinary, multi-sector multi research and developing projects including research programs and grants, infrastructure, equipment proposals, and projects to develop and translate designs through to prototype and products across a diverse range of areas including medical devices, big data, data analytics, training, Internet of Things, strategic business planning, yeah, and strategic business planning. <laughs> Very nervous. Oh, my company's here. So. Um, <laughs> um, so prior to joining Boeing, Nikki was director and secretary of Construction Arium. Am I pronouncing yes, that that's right? right? Construction Arium Australia, a non-for-profit which seeks to develop hands-on practical skills in young engineers. Nikki is passionate about innovation, diversity, and equity, and also promoting STEM uptake at all levels. She has a Bachelor of, with Honours in Chemistry, a Dip Ed in Stats and Educational Psychology yep. uh, with distinction, and an MBA and is a member of the BDF Investment Panel and is an MAICD. She also enjoys golf and runs regularly, albeit rather slowly. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Nikki Vasey. Thanks so much, Celeste, um, and thank you to you for, for coming in. I just wanted to start by saying this has got to be one of the most awesome conferences I've ever been to, and you guys are awesome, and I also wanted to say, before we even start, a thank you to our panel, a number of whom have travelled interstate just to be with us today. So um, thank you, guys. I think you should actually give yourselves all a big round of applause because you've been a fabulous audience before we even start. Um, I'm actually going to play a quick video. Um, this is literally a couple of minutes. Elevator Angels 3-0. 
So um, thank you to the Royal Australian Air Force for allowing, allowing us to show that video. That was deliberately, or that animation was deliberately put together um, to encourage um, females to take up STEM, but also to consider um, a career in aviation. What we wanted to say today was that aviation is much more than just being a pilot. And the panel actually reflects that diversity of opportunities and careers and skills that are needed to create the aviation and aerospace industries of the future. I just wanted to say, to iterate, thank you, Celeste, and I wanted to iterate that um, this, we do want this to actually be an interactive session. Um, the way we'll do it is we'll get the panelists to talk about themselves and introduce why they're passionate about aviation, about technology, about aerospace. Um, and then we'll also talk about some issues around retention. Um, we were going to sort of look at some of the, the downside, but I think this is an upbeat conference and I think we're looking to the future and looking to build and I think we can actually be really positive from that respect. Before I start I just wanted to say a couple of words just about about Boeing. So I'm part of Boeing Research and Technology. I'm based at the University of Queensland um, and uh, we've also got a colleague who's based down in, in Melbourne. We've got a couple of uh, interns as well who are based in the city. Boeing in Australia is actually the second largest Boeing outside the United States. So there's over 3,000 people. Um, the research and technology group is about 100. Um, we've got about 30 at, uh, at UQ. There's 14 PhD students. So Boeing's very active in STEM engagement, in alliance students, also in interns and in graduate positions. And those positions are a, a raft of different opportunities. So we have software engineers, we have mechanical engineers, obviously aerospace, but we also have um, biomedical engineers, metallurgists, and um, we've got a group that do numerical simulation of materials. So that's in advanced manufacturing. Um, so what I might actually start off with is, is ask the panel members to introduce themselves and just say a little bit about where they're from and um, their background and, and what attracted them to aerospace, engineering, uh, aviation or technology. So do you want to run down that way or do you want to come back this way? <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Fiona Jordan. I work for Virgin Australia Engineering. Um, what started me in engineering was actually doing an aircraft engineering apprenticeship, mechanical. I was lucky enough to have uh, my family owned an airline business. There was definitely no expectation, so there was a bit of a surprise when I put up my hand and said, how about I do an apprenticeship? I'd done numerous holidays of working down at the hangar sort of with the engineers working on the aircraft just as work experience so when I sort of put my hand up my mum encouraged me greatly to go forth and uh, conquer so to speak so I did my apprenticeship mechanical uh, worked on aircraft for a few years and slowly moved my way into the office um, different reasons why I moved into the sort of office management side of engineering, but it uh, gave me a lot of diversity. So in the 15 years I've worked at Virgin, I've been encouraged in four different roles. Um, that's uh, maintenance planning, uh, reliability engineering, fleet management, and I'm currently in the aircraft transfers group, which is a commercial and engineering side. So that uh, aircraft in, aircraft out of Virgin. So that's on the engineering side, ensuring that the engineering is correct, certified, and also commercial side. So with the, the leases and contract around leasing those aircraft is actually also um, maintained. And sort of once we throw out the operation of the aircraft and give the aircraft back, we're actually following all our processes and the lease around that aircraft. So that sort of sees my role um, within engineering and that's what keeps me there is the diversity and I've been encouraged from the workplace to do that and I've shown sort of encouragement in my own to try and increase my knowledge base as much as possible and I think I'm doing that so 
I encourage everyone to always ask for more, basically. Thanks, I'll Vera. hand over to Sophie. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Sophie. Um, oh, I've got two, that's exciting. Um, my name's Sophie. Um, so I currently study software engineering over at QUT, and I'm an undergraduate intern at Boeing, where I do software development work within their Phantom Works department. Um, I my story behind getting into aviation is probably not the usual one. I never considered myself to be in aviation. I never even considered it as a kid growing up. My dad's greatest dream for me was to be either a pilot or an astronaut. So, of course, that was the thing I wanted to do the least. Um, I had this idea of people working in aviation as smelly people in boiler suits inside an engine, and I'm horribly claustrophobic, and that just sounded horrible to me. So I started uni thinking that I'd get into something cool like robotics. Um, I thought I was going to be an electrical engineer and do all that kind of stuff. And then I decided that software was actually a lot more exciting than math. Um, so I decided to do software engineering. And I think I got into Boeing through um, the club that I'm in at uni, which I'm now the president of, the Women in Engineering Club GEMS. And Boeing's a very big partner with them. So through that, through a lot of events, I was, allowed, I was able to have role models within the industry who were in aviation and female role models who were doing awesome stuff and doing stuff that I actually found very, very interesting. And I was like, hmm, maybe aviation isn't just boiler suits and engines. Maybe this is actually going to be something fun. So I decided to do that. And I've been working at Boeing for the last 12 months, and it's been really awesome. They're very supportive of my degree. Thanks, Sophie. That's great. Sarah. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, so Sarah McSweeney, uh, once again from Boeing Research and Technology, this time down in Melbourne. Um, so I studied aerospace engineering. I actually was the Jasper kid, I think. I always just had an innate um, love of flying and a real passion for it. Uh, and I did see myself, it, it runs through the male side of my family, so I'd originally envisaged myself as a pilot, or actually originally as an astronaut was where I started out at the age of God knows what. Um, but with time, uh, my maths teaching mother persuaded me to give university a crack uh, before... Um, not doing any uni and going into flying like I talked about. Um, and I'd always had a real love of problem solving, which I think was bred through um, my school's very tech focus very early on. So in grade three, I was programming Lego Technic to solve you know challenges that we were given, et cetera. And that really stuck with me, that enjoyment of problem solving through technology. Um, so when I decided to give uni a crack, engineering seemed like an obvious place to go. And aerospace was, you know, got me into the airplane Part and what was going to be a year to appease my mother became actually I really love the problem side, problem solving side of this job, and uh, I've ended up as an aerospace engineer married to a pilot, which is kind of all kinds of strange. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I've had a great 14 years so far at Boeing. Um, it's been really lovely. I started out when the 787 Dreamliner was just very conceptual and new, and I got to um, work in very much conceptual design of the movable trailing edge, which is all designed and built in Melbourne if anybody doesn't know that. Um, and uh, I got to see that product through to detail design. And then I actually got to move down onto the shop floor and, and work through you know, challenges when you're making your first few parts, et cetera, and spent some time um, in the manufacturing support side and eventually got to follow it to Seattle for final assembly. They needed extra engineers in that space. Uh, so I, I think I hit the, 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 the final assembly line when Airplane 2 was still on it. So very early days. And, uh, and then since then, since having my um, first child, I, I moved into Boeing Research and Technology, um, which has been a really great different space which is all about thinking at the next aircraft future aircraft I'm particularly in the material science area my team are really looking at how do we use these carbon composites in new and novel ways um, that deliver um, lighter weight cleverer ways um, to put our aircraft together um, working alongside our robotics manager and finding ways that we can do it in a very clever uh, production system design way thanks Sarah that's great and Marie Hi, I'm Anne-Marie Burkill, and I think I'm an imposter on this panel because I have nothing to do with the aerospace or aeronautical community, apart from the fact that I'm Nikki's running buddy and, <laughs> <laughs> and she can outrun me at the moment because I've got a broken ankle, but that's another story. Um, only, only just. And, and number one fangirl. Um, and just a little anecdote, when we do go running, usually early in the morning, Nikki is forever telling me what that plane is in the sky, <laughs> like I care. <laughs> <laughs> so she really has landed in the perfect place being a complete nerd, but I digress. Um, I think um, I'm probably the perfect example of the fact that a science degree can take you anywhere. Um, I'm the co-founder of a $400 million venture capital fund, and we invest in all sorts of technologies, all sorts of amazing things, an artificial heart that can completely replace your heart, um, a vaccine delivery system that will replace the needle and syringe in our lifetime, um, all sorts of new diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, virtual reality, new education tools, the list goes on and on. So 
Um, I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. I'm a big advocate for women um, and diversity in general in STEM. Um, and, you know, I think uh, without labouring the point, I, I really sit here as a good example of the fact that having one of those qualifications, science, technology, engineering or mathematics, can take you into all sorts of areas, whether it's a traditional research career, whether it's uh, a commercial career like the, the ladies to my right. Sorry, I had to think about which side it was then. Um, or whether it's um, education, entrepreneurship, and you're going to hear from Alex in a moment, who's a wonderful entrepreneur, or indeed um, into the world of investment. Um, so thank you for having me here as an imposter. I, I hope I can contribute something. Thanks, Emory. Alex? Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Alex, I'm CEO and head designer of Canaria Technologies. We do advanced medical grade predictive wearables for use in aerospace, including astronaut training, and in the mining sector as well, kind of they were, they, they, the two extremes kind of mirror each other in terms of applications and practice, which is interesting. Um, so what we do is we're kind of a mixture between a medical device engineering company and an artificial intelligence company. Um, I really crashed into the aerospace sector in 2016. Uh, I ended up coming up with a proof of concept for what would become our flagship project, uh, product uh, for NASA in 2016 for remote uh, vital signs monitoring for astronauts. Uh, two days later, I had won the NASA Global Award for Best Use of Hardware that year and decided instead of making that a research project with NASA, my co-founder and I wanted to commercialize it. Um, as the total addressable market for uh, manned space exploration is six people <laughs> aboard the International Space Station. Uh, so we wanted to find much, much wider applications for the technology that we were developing. And yeah, very happy to continue to work in aerospace today, uh, especially in regards to, to pilots and just extreme environments as in general. It's kind of where our equipment becomes useful for, for people in those situations. Thank you. Alex. So just to keep things very simple, I'm another Alex. <laughs> uh, easy to remember. Uh, so I'm uh, Chief Executive Officer and one of the founders of a company called Miriota that does Internet of Things data connectivity, connecting industrial sensors and devices on the ground with tiny little shoebox sized satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, so very much more down the space end of things uh, as opposed uh, to aviation. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering and in fact in the kind of very far end mathematical ends of uh, something called information theory, which is the mathematics of how we transmit digital information. Um, and yeah, background, uh, I, I like to call myself a reformed academic. I escaped out of university. Uh, I've done another company, Coda Wireless, that is in the area of connected vehicle and uh, connected autonomous vehicles, uh, but now very much focused on um, Miriota and data connectivity um, using space technologies. Thanks, Alex. So one of the questions that um, is uh, a real issue in terms of attracting people, um, obviously we need people to take up STEM and continue STEM throughout school through to uni, but actually attracting people and making them think about aviation, aerospace is a real issue. Can the panels talk about some of the things that they do to actually attract people into technology, into aviation, into aerospace? Um, do, do you want to start, Sarah? Do you want to say, say something quickly? <laughs> well, you know, uh, Boeing does a lot of outreach. Uh, we do a lot of outreach into um, universities, partnering with universities. Um, our PhD sponsorships are particularly a great pipeline talent um, source for us, uh, particularly in the research and development area. And we've had some fantastic employees that have come out of that space. Um, uh, we're starting, you know, we're certainly doing stuff in schools, um, uh, but it's hard to, I think it's, it's difficult to get the kind of impact there. Um, you can get some great impact in very small numbers. Um, so I think we're still working on how do you get greater, broader impact um, in the young children. I think it's easier to get to conferences and get to um, potentially university students and and, um, uh, and people in, in their careers, but uh, we're still, I think, working on how do we get greater impact um, with those really um, younger people um, that are forming up in their brains, uh, what, it, what, you know, what these things look like and making, you know, absolutely making those calls around what engineering would look like, what um, aerospace would look like based on a lot of things that we see in the media that aren't overly accurate. You know, Big Bang Theory is the bane of my existence, frankly, that engineering is, is presented as a bunch of dweeby, mainly men, um, doing those kinds of things. So, yeah. 
What about the Alex's? How do you attract? How do you attract people to um, actually uh, apply, recognise your company? Do you? Yeah, well, we, we do a few things. So one, talking at events like this on a regular basis is really important to get word out. And the communities can be quite small for female engineers. So you usually know someone who knows someone who knows someone if you're trying to hire. Uh, two, we really actively have to look for female engineers when hiring. We don't always find them. Um, but just the fact that we say to recruiters or we make a point of we would like a female for this role increases the chances that we're going to find someone. Uh, two thirds of my board of directors are women, so that's important. Um, and our, our most impressive yeah, employee for artificial intelligence, who's our AI advisor, is a woman. She's a professional mathematician turned machine learning expert um, who really guides us um, overall with our artificial intelligence strategies, but also is good for networking. Because she's amazing at the technical side of things, but also is like a real person with an actual personality um, <laughs> who you can talk to, which is amazing. Not to say that men can't, but there is like this stereotype of the Big Bang Theory. And I, I think that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy with a lot of male applicants if they see that like, oh, if I'm socially not very good, that means that therefore I'm a technology genius. So we know in practice that's really not the case at all. Um, find that women tend to fall into that trap a bit less. Yeah. yeah I think I think for me the the thing uh, at Mariota is first of all recognising that um, we sort of asking what do you do to uh, attract people into STEM and particularly improving diversity and that and recognising that you actually do need to actively do something. Um, you know, in in fields like mine. Uh, electronic engineering with 10% of the graduating class being female. In my particular instance of when I graduated back in prehistory, uh, zero women, not a, not a one uh, in, in my class. So recognising that, okay, if you're just drawing randomly from the population, guess what you're going to get? You are just going to get, um, you're not going to get a diversity outcome at all uh, and you end up um, in, in kind of a pretty sorry state. Uh, so for us, um, there's sort of a couple of things that we're um, doing at Mariota. One is really focusing on our recruitment and our sort of workplace environment, um, which consists of doing things like going back to recruitment agencies and saying, sorry, not good enough, when we're handed a, uh, a short list of uh, all male candidates. Um, and then, you know, they come back and then somehow magically they managed to find more candidates. Um, we said, why didn't you just do that the first time? Um, so, you know, really uh, improving that um, intake into the company. And then the other thing, thinking about that small proportion, ultimately if, if as people are involved in management of companies, roughly speaking, we're sort of just vying for the same pool and then just pulling them around from different opportunities, which is great those opportunities exist. So then the thing that comes to mind is how do we increase the size of the pool? And that, as you're saying, is, is down at earlier, mm -hmm. earlier grades, which then becomes about engaging with schools and universities. Mm -hmm. So maybe Anne-Marie, um, in terms of when you look at a technology company, do you look at the mix? Do you look at the gender mix? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a sort of a comment to pick up on something that was um, um, said by Sarah earlier. I think, you know, it's an important um, statement to say that if you can't see it, you can't be it. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you an example. I have a little wee niece who, up until she was about seven, thought I was the best thing in the world. <laughs> we used to pick our dresses together for Christmas Day and she thought I was great. And just as I, she was getting to the age where I thought I was going to send her off to coding class because I was determined she was going to have a science career, she, her best friend's sister, who was a 15-year-old kind of Jim Bunny entered the frame and then she just, all that she really wanted out of life was to be a beautician that went to the gym like her, her best friend's sister. So the point I'm really trying to make with that little story is that, you know, we've, we've got to be good role models even for the little girls in our life um, and, and, and as parents we've got to make sure that they get a good exposure to a sort of vi wide range of, of different opportunities because that really is where people make up their mind um, early on, you know, what subjects they're going to pursue at school and that's the beginning of career choice really is the role models that we see. Um, but I think that to Nikki's question, um, we actually are probably one of the most diverse um, venture capital firms, not just in Australia but in the world. I mean, if you think it's bad in STEM, look at a VC. Um, uh, in venture capital, uh, it, the statistics may have changed a little bit. Something like 6% of all funds invested go to women. 
Um, there's very few women that start firms, very few women that make partner in firms and partners where the decision making is done. Um, and so we take diversity very seriously in our firm and we encourage it in our portfolio companies. Uh, we can't mandate that the technology companies appoint women, but we can do things like ensure that there's diversity on their boards because we sit on their boards. Um, we'll meet, we see about a thousand companies a year um, and we probably meet maybe a hundred of the thousand, but we meet almost every female um, led company that, that comes through the door, even if we know it's probably not going to be an investment, because it's an opportunity to give them feedback. Mm. Um, and hopefully, you know, next time they come around, they might be a bit further along and we can we can back them. So, it, you know, it, it, I think it goes back to the point that Alex was making. You've got to sort of force the odds in a direction um, to be able to get the outcome that you want. Actually, can I jump in with an important fact off the back of the bench capital startup world? The Harvard Business Review a few weeks ago released a really pivotal report based on an investment portfolio of 200 startup companies by a New York venture capital fund. If any of those companies had just one woman on their group of founders, it had a 65% higher chance of success mm -hmm. than all male teams. So that's really consistent with the points that I don't know how many people were in Kathy Foley's um, talk earlier today. That's consistent with that point she made, that a woman founder, um, a women representation on the board, um, women CEOs, the performance of the company is, is amazingly different and positive. I might just ask um, um, Sophie and, and also Fiona, um, what are attracted you to aviation what and, and what keeps you there we, we might we've, we've talked about attraction and that's the first thing you know having that visibility and encouraging people to to join but what about staying how, how do we keep people in that workforce because again going to Kathy's talk with females there's a real point of plateau where females leave in their 40s at the time when males are tending to move up their career ladder the females are, are plateauing and they maybe come back later, um, but not at the time. So, so you guys, you're, you're both important in terms of that, your thoughts. Um, I think what's kept me in aviation so far in my long 12 month long career has been that Boeing's been very supportive of me. And um, but yeah, it's been very supportive, very flexible. Um, I personally have a chronic pain condition and work's been very easy for that. I had to take a couple of weeks off for surgery. And I think Boeing as a company is really good um, with that kind of stuff. Um, but also um, I have mentors um, and I also saw in Boeing one of the reasons I applied there was I saw a lot of women that looked like me which is not something that I often see in the tech industry sometimes like, of course there's that stereotype where you know if you're a woman studying STEM then you kind of there's also that female stereotype where you are like the guys and you like don't wash your hair and stuff like that which is like completely untrue and I just never felt at home in that I expressed myself in a very feminine way and I never had really role models I guess anywhere that were female and expressed themselves in the same way as I did so having interactions with people like that has really been very very encouraging helped me to be more comfortable in my own skin comfortable expressing myself how I feel comfortable and then that of course makes me more productive but I think there's definitely still room for improvement in the industry. I would love to see a lot more support for people with chronic pain conditions because as women, we are very much more likely to have chronic pain than men. I have like a statistic from America where it's like the ratio of female to male of people with like IBS and like abdominal pain is like three to one. But um, there's still fight for things like period leave and that kind of stuff. There's still a lot of discussion around that. And I'd love to see a lot more support for that kind of stuff. But I think we've come a long way, and I've definitely felt very supported in my career so far. Thanks, Sophie. Fiona? So I guess, as I touched on before, the diversity of roles within a job is what sort of kept me, kept me going, kept me interested. And that's also kept me interested in making it visible to young females coming through. If you have presence across different roles or you can show that you can have presence across different roles, then that encourages them to stay and it encourages them to move on to another role to increase their knowledge, to increase their experience and to build on that. And then maybe, the, and we're hoping that that presence across there will then build into, say, the management sector. Um, we don't have many female managers, but we're slowly getting more females within the engineering group. So 
we're hoping to build on that. So in the more, you know, the more females, then maybe the more uh, applicable to management roles, and that's just going to be a perpetual, hopefully, build on, you know, then more females will be interested. And that's what keeps me going, is just there, there is such a diversity. There are, it's not, you know, it's not just being a pilot. It's not a smelly engineer. Um, there's a really broad spectrum. So uh, uh, hopefully, with that mentoring, um, we can encourage it and keep it going. Okay, thank you. So does anyone else want, Sarah, do you want to talk about how you encourage retention in, in terms of your group? And, and maybe say about number of people, because you're managing a few. Yeah, so I've got quite a large team at the moment, so 28 engineers. Um, I actually don't have the stat, which is bad, uh, on how many females, but I would say across our site, there's about 150 engineers on the site, I've got by far the highest proportion of women. It's around the it's around the 25% mark, which is quite a standout on our site. Uh, it's a lot higher. I haven't quite clocked exactly why I've got so many uh, more females, but when when they you know once the women are in the organisation, there seems to be a pull towards my team, and I think it's a number of factors. I think it's partly me as a female leader and a young uh, mother of young children. Um, I think it's partly critical mass. There's a, a number of women in the team, and therefore, you know, it looks like a nicer place to be if you are a woman. Um, more people like you, um, but also you know the huge thing around flexibility. That stat around people leaving at 40. It's not coincidence. That that's around the time that you're struggling. You know, there's the baby having, but then there's the dealing with the nightmare of sick children uh, and childcare and all of these things. Um, and the juggle is real. So I think um, it's really important that we get stronger fast on the flexibility on, um, you know, our industry, I think in aerospace is traditionally a lot more um, it's traditional. It's a lot more of that. You know, I expect to see you to know that you're doing your job. And um, I think the research and technology part of our business actually has moved a bit ahead of the rest of it. Uh, and therefore, uh, we can see results in that retention. Um, having recently gone through two rounds of mat leave myself, I've got um, really good appreciation for um, what worked well, what didn't, how important it is, particularly for retention, to stay in touch um, with that person. Um, I had very, you know, relatively different experiences between one and, and the other mat leave, and it was really marked to me how I felt coming back uh, the first time, having had very little contact with my with the business, with my leader, um, versus the second time with a very different um, senior leader who was um, inviting me out to coffee, bring the baby every month, um, and just the amount I understood about what was going on at work. It didn't feel like I was um, jumping off a cliff re-entering. Um, so yeah, I think there's a number of things we've got to do um, around just uh, flexible work, I think would be the, the number one in terms of retention. Um, but it's also about perceptions and I'd say about that maternity thing, another big one we've got to look at a bit is um, that period, having a discussion at lunch, that period from when a woman announces that she is pregnant um, to when she goes on mat leave is, is almost more difficult around some of the perceptions, depending on the organisation um, and, and the growth that can be quashed or that the missed opportunities in that time frame, if she's still raring to go, um, you know, others' perceptions around what, what tasks she should or shouldn't take on, travel, etc. Thank you. What, are, what about Alex? Both Alexes. <laughs> because you, you're in, um, in a startup, you know, the retaining staff and, and attracting good staff in the first place, but retaining staff is really critical to how your business goes. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, from, from my perspective, um, you know, having a company that's going from day one, it's you, like literally one person sitting <laughs> in a basement somewhere uh, growing forward. Um, Realising um, that as you grow, all of this kind of, uh, let's say, flexibility and all your processes and an approach to having a great work environment doesn't happen accidentally and you have to really think about what kind of environment you're trying to create for everybody um, and that, that, that is inclusive across gender, across um, cultural background, um, different people's beliefs and so on. Uh, and that actually takes energy and um, um, you need to be intentional about that. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to get what you get uh, kind of accidentally. Um, so that's something that, uh, for instance, just recently we had to really look at, oh, well, we kind of inherited some uh, leave policy that um, kind of we had some assistance early on. Here's a template. That's, go, that's good. Now you've got a leave policy. And then we started benchmarking against some of the other startups around saying, well, this is, this is not competitive, it's not offering the flexibility that people would want. Actually, regardless of, of gender, um, whether either it's paternity leave or maternity leave, providing people with the flexibility that they need in their lives. We don't need them to be chained to the desk you know, every minute of the day. So 
Um, and reflecting on that, um, we uh, sort of was um, just uh, sort of spying on people a little bit on our Slack channel. We have a staff movements channel. And I would say on a day-to-day -day basis is between 10 and 20% of our staff who um, are taking advantage of flexib flexibility, um, dropping off kids, leaving early, going to a doctor's appointment or whatever, and just being accepting of that. And yet all the work uh, still gets done. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose in many ways I found something similar. So to give some context, I, my company's got a core team of seven. Um, so we've actually not had to deal with maternity issues yet. For, for us, at the, we're three years in, and for the stage that we're at, so much of our focusing goes onto the recruiting process of it. And it, we, do a re, we now do a really rigorous recruitment process where you have to pass a week-long technical test and also a culture test. And if you don't, get, if you don't ace both, we don't hire you. Um, the reason being that we're very upfront with the starter, well, it's a full-time job. Like, my work days are easily 12 to 14 hours long, and you have to keep going for years and years in that pace and try to avoid burning out at the same point, at the same time as that. Um, so we found that to avoid culture issues, we need to make sure, like, we've, we really quite a sense, a sense of humour is really important, because, like, if you're just, you, just to survive those hours, you have to have a good sense of humour about it. And we take a very fostering talent approach as well. Um, so we really listen to what the needs of each, each of the lead of... Uh, the different technical and business sides of, of our company really needs. But as an example, because we did make hiring mistakes in the past that actually almost tanked the company at one point. Um, so if someone's not up to scratch, we really don't hire them. So we've just hired um, a new data scientist for a quite specific role. It took us two years to find someone who, who, wow. could, pass both the, who, could, both, who could pass both the technical and the culture test. And in those two years, we ended up working, not even with contractors, but we ended up working with small uh, machine learning and mathematics specialist companies to bridge that gap in the interim. Because once someone's in a startup, they're in. They'll probably have an equity stake in the company at some point, even if it's small. So you need to make sure that you really do have long-term alignments, that they understand that if you're in it to build a billion-dollar company, that's not a one- or a two-year process. That's seven years non-stop. And you can't really take a break whilst you're doing that. Um, I think it is possible for women and people with children to do that, but it's, they need very supportive partners at home and it's just difficult to manage. Um, but we found that once we establish this process of like, these are the terms, this is what we're aiming for, can you pass both? Then the team almost runs itself after that point. And again, like, then we don't do strict work hours, it's if you've hit this task for the week and if you finished it, great, go have a beer on a, on a Friday. Like, good for you, get back to it on Monday. Emery, you're known as a great mentor and um, supporting um, CEOs in particular and, and founders of companies. What's important to you to ensure people are retained and, and um, keep that burning sort of passion for their technology? How do you support them, it's particularly female, particularly female? So I'm conscious we're doing a lot of talking. How many people in the room are, are, are mentored in a formal program? If they're little hands up, but wow. I, I'm thinking it's about 10%. And how many people mentor other people? So it's probably more mentors than mentees in the room, which is interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so Nikki's right. I mean, I've, I've been involved in both formal and informal mentoring programs for most of my career for particularly women. Um, and I see it as, as very important. I mean, I don't think it has to be formal. Um, I just think really the key to good mentoring is that the mentee actually wants it. That's going to sound like a completely stupid thing to say, but I've been matched with people in mentoring programs that have got no idea what they want to achieve, um, that are kind of there because they kind of were told to be there. Um, and you can't, you know, you, that saying, you can't lead a horse to water. Um, so I think, you know, if you are seeking um, mentoring, then it's really critically important to think about what you want out of that relationship. As a mentor, it's not your job to determine that. Um, but I do think mentoring is really important. It, it's the everyday mentoring of just making sure that the people that are um, your direct reports get what they need to um, be able to manage their workload and manage the personalities around the office um, and, and the interactions that they've got to have with various stakeholders. And then, of course, there's the more sort of formal programs of, of just really helping people to sort of develop their career path 
um, take those steps to upskill or whether that's formally or informally. Um, and I think you, mentoring is sort of almost a sort of an, um, an endemic thing. It's, it's there in every day in all of our careers and we've all got a role to play. Um, with re irrelevant how experienced we are or how senior we are, some of the best mentoring that I've seen has been peer to peer at a very junior level. Um, just people, you know, talking about things that they've got in common, and I think that's a point that you made earlier, right? Um, that you know, that if you see someone that is like you, that you can discuss the issues that confront you. That's just as important a mentoring relationship as having, you know, someone that's much more senior. And I think it's very important. I think that's a great point. And I mean, from my experience. Ask, you know, ask, ask people if you're not mentored, why not, I think is the question that you should be asking yourself. And, you know, go for formal schemes. They, they can differ quite wildly. Some are really successful, some are not so successful. But do the informal stuff too. You know, ask, ask someone if they'd like a cup of coffee. Um, ask someone you look up to if they'd be able to spare time for a cup of coffee and a chat. And, no, you, you know, they, all they can say is no and... You, you, you've not lost anything, you know, so give it a go. And most people will say yes, you know, I'd, I'd love to. And most people, if you get on and you have a bit of a chat, most people will actually continue to do it so you catch up on a regular basis. So I think that's a, that's a really good point. I'm sort of conscious of time, and as Anne-Marie said, I'm sort of conscious that the, the room's been sitting here really quietly. I'd, I'd actually like to throw it open to, to questions if people would like to. Do we have some questions? We stunned you all into silence. You're all, you're all off texting potential mentors. <laughs> yes, Ruth. <laughs> no, get us get us kicked off. Gone. Um, my question's probably more to Fiona and perhaps to Sarah. Um, we've got a, we've done a lot of talk here about engineers, and you know, yeah, we have really poor. We need with 16% or something across engineering as a whole. Um, I did some research for the Women in Aviation conference where I spoke at, and my shock was the number of trades, female trades. It was 0.1% for AME, so aircraft maintenance engineers. 0.1%, that's like one person across, one female engineer across the whole of AMEs. You know, that was absolutely shocking. What can we do to get more women into trades that are just as vital as engineers? Good question. Yeah, very good question. Um, considering I was the only apprentice in my year as a female, um, and I was the first in Western Australia to actually do the apprenticeship, so I absolutely know where you're coming from, and I also know that there is a very big stigma around females still within that mechanical role. Do they have the understanding? I mean, you know... As a child, you grow up, you might be, as a male child, grow up and you fix the car with your father. So you've, you've got a mechanical-based understanding, maybe. As a female, you don't tend to maybe do that so much. So there's that perception that you, you haven't got that base knowledge, so how are you going to learn it or how are you going to know it to begin with? Um, so I think we need to remove that and also remove the you have to be better than the man to actually get somewhere, which I know I've done, and Sarah's probably done as well, to prove yourself. Now, I should just be proving myself, standing next to whoever's standing next to me, not trying to prove that I'm better because that person might be a male and I'm a female. So it, it is quite a di difficult thing to do, and I guess it's education. Um, trying to educate these women that that's that's not that's not what we're trying to gain here and you don't have to do that to still be you know good at your role the best at your role um, Sarah's probably got a better... Oh, no, I'm sure I don't. Um, I just say, it's something we're really passionate about. So, uh, like I mentioned it um, back at home in Melbourne, we've got a huge manufacturing site. Um, and, yeah, our shop floor numbers for females are shocking, particularly in the assembly area. So, in the fabrication area of the carbon composites, a lot of that is actually, you know, the materials are... They're a fabric when we when we lay them down. Um, and there was a time that some recruitment was done very actively a few years back where they went out, uh, I think there was a, some kind of fabric firm was going out of business. And there was somebody clever went and said, hey, ladies, you know, like, that are coming out of there, there's these great jobs down the road. So we have got some ladies in the, um, some women in the, in the layup areas, but the assembly areas, the numbers are 
appalling. Uh, I mentor one of the, I think, two assembly operators that we have um, out of the few hundred, and she's doing an engineering degree. So she's likely, you know, that is awesome. So I'm like, yes, but she won't be on the shop floor anymore um, when she completes that most likely. So um, I, I think it's, I think so much of it is about how we market uh, what the jobs are, because the thing that drives me crazy, I guess, is that I look around, you know, those are very well paid, excellent jobs. Um, and we bring people in um, that don't have trade. Some, some of them have trade, some of them don't. We give them training and they do this work. It's extremely well paid. The conditions are fantastic, you know, great overtime, etc. What drives me crazy is that I see, you know, so many women in very lowly paid jobs working very, very hard, whether it's in aged care, childcare, etc. I think they're just unaware um, that there, you know, of these other options. Um, uh, but I think it also is how we write our adverts. So that's the work I was talking to our HR director just this week, um, uh, and she was saying that they've, you know, been really looking at that from an adversity standpoint, and they realise that they've got the word lifting in our ad for our um, operators, and like you know, that's going to set off all kinds of, you know, mechanisms in the brain about what that looks like. So how do we talk about that differently? So, um, yeah, I think we've got to get creative about how we get the word out to women about these kinds of work, um, what the conditions are. I think, you know, Metro Trams, for instance, have done that really well. Um, but I think it's, yeah, a lot of it's marketing of how we do it. And a lot of it's the media, you know, what, what do we see out there? If you see anything that, you know, any movie that shows people working on an aircraft, I don't know that I've ever seen it be a female. Yeah. I'd like to just follow up with a stat, and again, it refers back to Cathy Foley's talk as well, but um, some research out of UQ's business school showed that um, girls are actually paid something like 75% of the pocket money that boys are paid. Um, and, and a lot of that's because the boys are doing stuff outside, so they're mowing the grass and doing, and, and the, the girls are doing um, household chores or making beds or whatever. Um, and so Kathy said that she actually paid her kids, her boy kids, to do the housework. And so that, which I just thought, that's the way to do it. You know, that's equal pay. You, they have to do certain things. So, um, so when you do um, encourage outdoor, encourage activity and, and so on is really important. So we've got a, another question. Hello. Um, my question is a bit of a different direction. It's about um, owning your femininity. femininity. Um, I guess it's really awesome to hear that Boeing has such great role models in that space, but I know that's not typical, I guess. Um, so my question would be, like, how do you go at an executive level or a board level in terms of, I don't know, owning the fact that you're a female and that you're awesome? <laughs> Some shoes. Yeah, actually, I think, okay. Okay. Um, shoes. I think, yeah, I think I think we've actually got to get one of our panel members to stand up at the moment, and I'm sorry, this will be lost on the. Yeah, actually, can we get a, can we get a mic over so I can stand properly? Uh, over. Yeah. I have so, stories. I have stories about this and the startup communities and ecosystem. Okay. So firstly, with the way that I tend to dress to tackle these kind of issues, I don't tend to dress as a businesswoman. I tend to dress about. I tend to dress what a drag queen imagines a businesswoman would look like. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about theatre. So uh, these are my pitch shoes. They're eight inches high, um, eight to ten inches high. <laughs> but there are there are reasons why I do stuff like this. The reality is, on stage, I am expected to be better than male founders, and I get questions that are three times harder than anyone else on stage. Doing stuff like this makes me about six foot two. <laughs> makes me taller than most men in the room. So for an example, when I'm pitching in something like this, it tends to eradicate just a bunch of nonsense, so I just don't have to deal with it anymore. So as an example, I was giving a pitch uh, relatively recently, and I started to get questions from the audience, and a few of them like, mm, it'll like mm, critiquing for the sake of critiquing, meh, like questions. And uh, one guy came up to me afterwards, like a kind of small, middle-aged engineer type, like, I could tell he was, like, ready to, like, give me just some stupid criticism that was just not, just not relevant or appropriate, but then walked up to me off stage, looked up, and then literally did a 180 <laughs> and walked away. <laughs> so that's... Thank you. That, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Does that answer your question? Thank you. I might um, have a follow-on response to that question, if I can. Um, I think... Um, this is a really important question because we tend to get bogged down when we talk about diversity, about talking about male and female, um, and we forget that within gender there's a whole spectrum of different um, behaviours and attitudes and subtypes. Um, and, you know, certainly some of the women that I encounter, I'm on the board of about 
seven companies at the moment. Some of the women that I encounter in the boardroom are very aggressive, equally as aggressive as the men are in the room. And if you took the image away, you probably couldn't tell who was who. Other people are softer um, and everything in between. Um, and I think, you know, what, what's important is to encourage diversity. And I know that sounds like such a cliche. It's like yawn. But we, we've got to let men express different behaviours as well as women express different behaviours. And, I mean, we've just submitted an application for our Industry Diversity Award and um, our Industry Peak Body Diversity Award. And it was a real pleasure to be reporting things like how many of our workforce identified as LGBTI, how many were from different countries, um, how many had different educational backgrounds as well as different genders. And, and you know, all those things are to be, to be I think, um, included in your sort of diversity metrics. But I think the more that we um, are ourselves in those situations, um, in the executive suite around the boardroom table and don't try and conform to the norm, the more that we naturally surface diversity. And if that means that we are more feminine, um, that's a good thing. Just one sort of final point. It amazes me when you get men aside, outside of the bullpen, how many of them are so concerned about the things that we call feminine. I mean, when you sort of unpack it, men are concerned about um, uh, the so not, not having adequate soft skills to handle tricky HR matters, for example, um, how they manage things like um, mental illness in the workforce, how they manage their own mental and physical health. So I think that the, the sort of change is there um, and we just need to continue to sort of encourage diversity generally and to be authentic um, about ourselves and, and you know, wh where our moral compass sits and how we want to behave in those situations. And I think have confidence in what you are. You know, everyone is different. Everyone comes to every situation with their own perceptions. And to remember that and try and depersonalise, that's the other thing that I think is quite important is actually it's very easy to, to internalise things and actually trying to see things how others see it is actually a, a positive. If you've never seen it, there's an awesome book that I've just read called Crucial Conversations. <coughs> Um, and it talks to you about um, how to have those difficult conversations and, and really gets to the heart of how to be authentic. Um, and I, I'm 55 and I thought that I couldn't really learn too much more about myself, but I realised I've been a terrible conversationalist <laughs> <laughs> in those really difficult times because of that book and it's really made me adjust how I speak to people when it's difficult. So that's a, a book that's well worth picking up and buying. Thank you. Do we have another question? I just had something to add on that. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's sorry, something sorry. that's very close to my heart because as a person, I do express myself very femininely. I like feminine things, but I also do like doing like fairly typically masculine things. And something that I kind of noticed, and especially growing up, I had a very assertive mother. And <laughs> the way that she kind of dealt with her internalised kind of misogyny was um, things like Barbies, that kind of stuff, which I actually really love playing with. Those like little cooking kits where you can make things, so good. But I've noticed that we shame we look down and shame men for being feminine and we do the same behaviour for women that are excessively feminine. So I used to feel really, really bad the fact that I like Barbies more than tools, but I never, I would, I would go out of my way to buy remote control cars and that kind of stuff because I thought that would make me cooler and that kind of thing. And I have noticed that when, as soon as I started working, I started doing the same thing. So I dress a bit more masculine, I toned down my makeup looks, put my hair back so I could fit in more. And I noticed that that really affected my mental health quite aggressively. Um, because for me, my self-expression is very, it's very tight with how I see myself, and that's not the case for everyone. But I've also, I'm also a firm believer in like being the diversity you want to see. So I now don't turn down my look ever because I know that if I see, if some other woman who's scared to express herself that way sees me, and like being myself and also being kind of badass, doing tech work, that kind of stuff. My, it's like my hope that like me being true to myself can then help someone else be true to themselves. And I'm, I, I, I do a lot of um, workshops with school-aged kids with my club and I always dress as femme as possible for them because there's a lot of girls that come in and they're super, super scared to express themselves. And I'm just like, well, if like maybe embarrassing my little bit, myself a little bit, going a bit over the top can make them feel more comfortable than like job well done, make someone feel a bit better about themselves, it's good stuff. Thank you. It's a really interesting point that you make about um, uh, the shaming of, of children to be this, that or the other and it's, I found it really interesting having had a daughter first and I must say I am very 
I don't even go at her. She uses dolls, but I'm certainly trying to shove the Lego in her hands. Um, <laughs> she's three and a half. Uh, yeah, yeah, both is good, exactly. And I, I'm trying to just, you know, my, my husband find it hilarious when she insists that everything has to be sparkly and purple. He's like, that was coming to you. It's karma. Um, but my son, who's one and a half, what's been really interesting is that there is so much acceptance of girls um, being whatever they want to be and dressing however they want to dress. Um, but G already it started. He's not yet one and a half. He's got lovely, you know, curls at the back and already, you know, there's been a bunch of comments from family and friends that the boy needs a haircut, you know. Like, uh, you know, at one point, the, you know, one of the daycare workers put a little hair tie just into his hair and it was, you know, um, my progressive husband, was, I could see him trying to internalise his horror, but he was a bit like... You know, he, uh, he's off a farm and, he, you know, it's all of these things. But I, I can see um, when I shop for my daughter at Even Cotton On, there's so many cool slogan T-shirts that are all about doing anything, being anything. And when I go shopping for my son, there's, like, it's still really gender stereotype blues maybe greens and greys and there's like I can't find him anything with some pink on it um, or, or purple to mix it up and it's yeah it's just part of the problem I think. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've got time for way, one more quick question maybe. Did we? Was there someone at that? I saw a hand. No? Okay. Go on Ruth. Go on. Um, oh, one, I've got so many points from what you just said. Yeah. One, <laughs> John is willing to say it's really hard and I haven't figured it out. I went and spoke to a four-year-old class two weeks ago with my husband who's a pilot. He went in the uniform, right? So he looked cool. Uh, and it was boys and girls. At the end of it, and I tried to really talk up aerospace engineering or engineering in general. I used the words that I thought would connect around it's about problem solving. It's about solving problems. I love solving problems. At the end of the talk, my husband said, so who wants to be a pilot? And a bunch of hands went up. They were mainly boys. And who wants to be an engineer? And there was zero. And I think I got a pity one. So I haven't figured it out. Um, I do think it's definitely language, right? It's definitely language. And you know, we just read the book called Baby Loves Aerospace Engineering. If you have children, uh, get around it. It's a great little book. There's one on Thurman Dynamics too. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't cracked it yet. We've got to talk about it in a way that girls connect with. I've always thought that problem solving is the right way um, as opposed to building things, making things. But. but I think that the example of your husband in the pilot suit says it all. I mean, it's... Coo <laughs> it's un cool role models, right? I mean, you know, just showing people you can't be it if you can't see it. So how do we, how do we show people um, that, that people have these really amazing, fulfilling, rewarding careers? Um, and look, there are a lot of you in the room that would say that about your careers, right? That it's been really amazing, rewarding and fulfilling. We've just got to get those stories out. I think that's the, the main answer. And that's one of the reasons we're here today, is to try and, and say there's a real, you know, you're not just a pilot, it might be very cool, but you're not just a pilot. There are so many different opportunities across the technology space that, and aviation, aerospace, um, and you can do whatever you want, you know. It's, um, so my daughter graduated a couple of years ago and she didn't know, she got panicky because she didn't know what she wanted to do. Um, and I said, you can do anything, you know, you can, it, you don't have a career, necessarily have to have a set career path, you can do anything. Right. So, yes. So does the panel want to, we've got very few seconds left, does the panel want to add anything? Does anyone have anything they wanted to, to add at all? I just want to encourage people to mentor people. Yeah, Because that's I agree. been the most important thing in my development and mentoring is such a rewarding experience and I just think if more people mentored, we would solve all these problems very quickly. <laughs> I've actually learned far more from the people I've mentored than, than being men, you know, um, than I think they've learned from me. So, um, yeah, it is at all. And reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out. Really, you know, 
no matter what level you are in terms of career, reach out because that network is, is just so useful, really is. So um, I've got, I'll throw in a plug and say that Boeing <laughs> and aerospace companies in general, uh, I'm sure you've figured it out by now, but are really, uh, really after good software um, engineers and, and coders. Um, the more and more we do, even with the manufacturing stuff, it's all digital simulation first, verification in a lab. So I think when we think about, you know, Boeing, I think struggles to sometimes attract uh, software engineers because it's not the front of mind place, but it's certainly um, a space that we're going more and more. We need more and more good talent, particularly diverse talent. And that there's some really cool things in terms of visualisation, in terms of mixed reality, new technologies. And, um, you know, there really is the opportunity to, to, to play and to innovate, which is fabulous. So, OK. Um, we are out of time now, and um, the moderator's told me to get off the stage. So, um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much to the panel, um, all of you taking your time out of your busy days, and um, it's been really wonderful being able to talk with you and, um, and listen to your views. So thank you very, very much. Can we please give another round of applause for Nikki Vasey for moderating our panel today as well? I really like the comment about um, the power of how you dress. In about two hours' time, I'm swapping my heels for some steel caps, which I think is really awesome. <laughs> it's, re it's really empowering, I think, to go to be able to go from one extreme to the other and still be, still be a woman, still be female, no matter what you look like as well. Um, and I think that's really important for us to know. So um, thank you very much for joining our session today. We will need to clear the room in um, two minutes ago. <laughs> there Sorry. is a session now. There is a break. But feel free to stay back and chat to the panel members if you want to have any more questions. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you.